Hello Internets, and YouTube in particular. This is Sabrock, and I am here with a review of the uh, Star Trek Attack Wing Wave 4 ship, the Nistrum Raider for the Kazon faction. Uh, WizKids just put up the preview earlier today, uh, and there's been a lot of talk about it in the forums and the Facebook groups that uh, I'm a part of, and so I thought I would uh, give my opinion of it. Um, to start off with, the ship itself, uh, I am really torn on. Um, it's got it's got good maneuverability. Uh, it's got a 180 degree arc, uh, both of which are fantastic. Um, it's relatively cheap. It's on the cheap end. It's at uh, 20 points for the unique, 18 for the uh, for the generic. Um, at two attack, it's it it would fall into the camp of useless to me. Um, two agility is not as good as three would be, uh, if if that makes any sense. Um, two agility I find to be not significantly more useful than one agility in most cases. Um, it's when you start getting to three or more that you really start to be able to consistently negate hits. Um, and at three hull and three shields, or two shields for the generic, it's a relatively fragile ship. Not as fragile as some we've had. Um, for example, the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the Jem'Hadar fighter I think only has... Uh, uh, a total of five hit points. I might be thinking of the. Uh, am I thinking of the the unique? Anyways, it's it's pretty fragile. Uh, it can be easily one shotted with a bad uh, uh, evade roll by even a moderately powerful ship. Um, and uh, I just. If it weren't for the special ability, I would never see the ship being run at all. Um, its special ability is it gets plus two attack when using its primary weapon against a ship that has a scan token by it. And this makes the Kazon Raider a Federation killer. Um, it's only got uh, two crew upgrades, uh, crew upgrade slots, which I think is, is average. I think most ships have two. Um, it's, it's actually quite a bit for a ship this small. Um, so, so with its, its primary attack is rolling four or five at range one even. Um, which could then actually make it a very powerful ship because it's got uh, it's got battle stations, it's got uh, target lock. It actually can't take a scan action, which is kind of unusual for a ship that doesn't cloak. Um, so uh, I think it it can be good. I'm just not sure that it is good already. And as a general rule, you're going to want to start with a ship that is already good and make it better with upgrades, rather than starting with a mediocre or bad ship and making it passable with upgrades. Um, but I, I think against Federation, it's actually really good value for those 20 points. Um, it's also going to be really good against uh, the Borg and against the, uh, the Jem'Hadar battleship. Any ship that has uh, no, uh, no evade dice normally... Uh, it's it's going to be really good at um, when when you're using the upgrades that it comes with, and I'll get to those in just a little bit. Um, but I think that's mainly what the Kazon are for. They're fi for fighting the big slow ships. The Kazons against Klingons or Romulans, it will get destroyed. These guys are worthless against any ships that can cloak, any ships with really high uh, uh, high front end attack power. Um, but they're, they're going to do really well against the, uh, the, the moderate dice of the Federation. They're going to do really well against the, uh, the, the Borg ships that can't, can't evade. Um, so overall, I think the Nistrum Raider is probably a, a decent ship. It doesn't have the faction, uh, the faction support that other ships have, which I think will be necessary to make it a good ship. If we ever get the, uh, the Kazon Predator ship, the, the great big one, um, out, if it might come with some really good cards, and that that might be useful for the raider. And some of the raiders' cards, I think, would actually be really useful for a larger ship. So if we get one that has like a natural four or five attack and uh, like 10, 10 total hit points, it's probably a bit much. Um, uh, then uh, then some of the the raiders' cards are going to be really good for that. Um, but until then, I just don't see the the raider being. Uh, being a highly competitive card. Um, the, the main captain is Kulla, uh, and he allows you to discard one of your crew cards in order to get a free action that from the actions listed on your action bar. Um, 
He's really cheap for getting free actions. He's only two points, and he's a skill four captain. Um, so he's basically like the lowest end captain you can get that gives you free actions. The problem is, again, faction support. Um, the the Nishram Raider comes with three crew cards, and aside from Seska, uh, the other two discard themselves to use them. So you're choosing between getting to use your upgrades, which are not cheap, or getting your uh, your free actions. You can't do both. So I think Kala, his, his ability is not as useful as it seems to be, and it doesn't actually seem to be all that useful to begin with. I think Kala is a bad captain card. I'm gonna go out I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I think Kala is bad and I don't foresee anyone running him ser in any sort of serious competitive environment. Um, the other captain is Retic, um, who uh, who's a two skill for one point and he has to reroll a blank die every time you defend. And uh, the defense dice have three sides being blank, so that's actually gonna happen quite a bit. Um, if uh, if I ever see the uh, the raider being run, it should have Riddick as the captain. Um, I just I don't see any reason to ever run Kulla. Um, other, I mean, unless you really need those extra two points of captain skill, I don't I don't see that happening. Um, I, don't, I don't think that that would make much of a difference. If you're going to settle for a two or a four, you're not counting on shooting before the enemy. So there's frankly, are there any? Three skill captains? I'm not sure. I don't know that it would ever make a difference. But anyways, Redick I think is a much better captain than Kulla. Uh, you get a lot more value for his one point. And then we move on to the uh, the three um, the three crew cards. We have Seska, uh, who as an action can target a ship at range two to three, disable her and one crew upgrade on that ship. Um, it's basically like a more limited O'Brien. Um, uh, the, uh, the 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 two-point O'Brien from the starter set. Um, but she can only target out to range two or three. She can't do anything at range one for some reason. I'm not actually, not actually sure what the logic is behind that. Um, and uh, uh, you disable her to disable one crew upgrade. Oh, no, that's right. O'Brien is, uh, O'Brien is any, any upgrade. Well, shoot. Because Seska's four points, and she doesn't operate at range one, and she doesn't... Oh, it's because she disables herself instead of discarding. That's her advantage. That's why she's more expensive. But she only targets crew, whereas O'Brien would target any upgrade you like. Um, uh, so and it doesn't matter if the ship has shields up. It doesn't matter if they're cloaked. So uh, you, can, you can pretty reliably shut down any crew upgrade you like using Seska. For four points, I'm not sure that that's worth it, because even though she only disables instead of discarding, you are at best... Well, I think I think in, in an ideal situation, you activate after the opponent, good luck with the Kazon captains available, um, and disable a crew card that they need to use that round. So they're, they've already activated, they can't reactivate it this round, and they have to wait till next round to reactivate it. But other than that specific scenario, you are trading your action for their action. Most of the time, that is going to break even, and you're spending four points to do it. So your opponent gets their four points to use. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what to think about Seska, because she definitely has uses. Um, she's probably the most useful of the uh, the three cards that the Kazons come with. Um, but I'm not sure that she's worth four points. I think if they priced her at three, she'd be a lot more competitive. And I'm not sure... I, I mean, if if you've only got a ship with one... Uh, uh, with You only have one ship in the entire faction. Um, you can afford to undercost their cards a little bit because they're going to be more expensive if you use them elsewhere. Um, and Seska, I think, is the only one of the crew. Let me do double check. Oh no, the uh, Tierna can can be cross factioned. Um, so I think, I mean, the Kazons they don't have a whole lot going for them to begin with. I think a few cheaper upgrades would have done them some good. Um, so Seska is a decent card, but I don't think she's worth all the points that that are asked for her. Um, next we have Tierna. Um, 
He, as an action, if your ship is not cloaked, you can disable all your remaining shields and target a ship at range 1 to 2. Uh, that is also not cloaked and has no active shields. Then you discard him and roll two attack dice. The target ship takes uh, normal damage to its hull for each hit and crit. Um, and it doesn't roll any defense dice against it. So it's kind of like... Um, Oh my gosh, what's his name? Gelnon, the uh, the Dominion Captain. It's almost exactly the same effect, except that uh, it's out to range 2, and you don't get the Battle Stations effect, which is a really good thing for uh, for that kind of an effect to have. Um, the other thing is that this damage goes straight to their hull. Oh, but they don't. They can't have shields up anyways. So, uh, that, I guess that doesn't really matter. Um, strange that they specified that it does go to the hull. Anyways, and he's only 3 points. Um... And, uh, and on the one hand, I kind of think that this guy's really good because it's two extra attack dice um, worth of damage. It's not modified by your battle stations. You can't spend target lock to, uh, to re-roll them. So it's not as good as actually adding those dice to your main attack. Um, but it does have the advantage of, like, if, if a ship has one health left, uh, you can just finish it off and then spend your actual attack on another ship. Or, or split it up for any other reason you like. Um, and it is either 100% or 50% of your attack output, depending on if you're attacking ships with scan tokens or not. Um, so, I, uh, for a Kazon ship, I think Tierna has pretty decent value. Actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think the uh, I think Tierna might be the best card in the Kazon pack. Um, specifically for the Kazon ships. Um, and it's strange that he's able to cross-faction. Because his value is going to go way down for other uh, other ships, because other ships that have decent attack values, adding two dice worth of damage only when you have your shields down and you're not cloaked, and the opponent has their shields down and they're not cloaked. It's a really situational card. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't foresee him... Uh, I mean... Because you gotta, you got to take into account that you're spending an action to do this. you got to get a certain amount of value out of it. And that value has to be better than the actions that are on your action bar. And by default, every ship except a couple of them have target lock, which increases your, your damage expected output by 50%. Battle Stations does the same thing. Um, scan will reduce the maximum uh, uh, defense, or the, the maximum number, what is it? Scan increases your maximum potential damage if you uh, if you have modifiers from other sources. Um, so uh, so things which add a specific number of attack dice, uh, such as the special ability of the uh, the Gemadar attack ship or Tierna or Gelnon, they add they add a number of attack dice. They're only really good for ships that have very small attacks to begin with, because then your percentage increase is is much greater. Uh, whereas you stick this guy on a, a, a ship like the battleship, like the Jem'Hadar battleship, it's got six natural attack, and you add two, you're only adding one expected damage. Any of the actions on your action bar are going to be better than that, mathematically speaking. Um, so uh, so overall, I think Terran is a good card for the Kazon. Probably not worth cross-factioning, unless for some reason you want to put it on another small ship. I guess he could. I guess he could go well on like a, a, a the Romulan Vo, um, this tiny ship with a lot of defense and only one natural offense. I mean, you're you're, you're uh, tripling the uh, the uh, the the damage output for that. But you have to be decloaked, and the Vo I think never wants to decloak. Um. So. So yeah, I I, I think Tyrion is a good card for his faction. Um. Not sure if he has uses outside of that. Uh, and now we move on to the Kazon Raiding Party, which seems to be the card that everybody's talking about a lot. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's nice, at least, that it doesn't take an action to do. Uh, it triggers when you're attacking. If you inflict at least two damage uh, on, the, uh, on the ship, you can discard it to reduce the damage to exactly one critical damage that ignores the opposing ship's shields, goes straight to the hull, and then you can disable one of that ship's tech upgrades and steal it even if it goes above your, uh, your, your ship's uh, capacity. Um, this can only be purchased for a Kazon ship, so you're not going to be able to be putting... You're not going to put this on a Klingon ship that's likely to deal uh, two or more damage per attack. Uh, and it also costs five points to do. Now let me, let me put this... 
into perspective here and explain why I think that this card is garbage, at least until we get a bigger Kazon ship out here. You have to inflict at least two damage. That is not roll two hits. You have to have two uncancelled hits, which means it's never, ever going to happen against someone who is not scanning. Um, it's never going to happen against somebody who's cloaking. Uh, it's never going to happen against uh, someone with an interface generator, for example. Um, there's just, I mean, I don't, I don't think that this card is ever going to be of use to anybody. Um, particularly because any ship that's carrying tech upgrades worth carrying are, are going to be, they're going to be defended against it for sure. Um, I, if I see my opponent fielding a Kazon raiding party, I chuckle and ignore them. Uh, uh, first off, because I don't run a whole lot of tech to begin with. Um, but, uh, but also, you're sacrificing damage at the same time. If it was just steal the tech, sure, you have nothing better to use your five points on. There's always a better thing to use your five points on. Um, you, you throw this on there, it's like, yeah, I'll steal some tech. Too bad if it's disabled, you know, whatever, don't care that it's disabled, at least I'm taking it away from my opponent. But you're, you're sacrificing your two, theoretically, more damage um, in order to deal only one critical damage. And it does ignore their shields. It's a crit to the hull. Uh, there, there's some value to be had there. I just... The fact that it doesn't work unless you inflict at least two damage, and then you also have to discard the card... If, if at least you didn't have to discard the Kazon Raiding Party, if it was reusable every time you score at least two damage with it, it would be an, uh, it would be a good card. It would that would make all the difference. It, that would go from worthless to uh, uh, a core part of this ship, and I would expect to see it on every Kazon ship. Um, but as it is, oh my gosh, I just the. This is one of those cards, like I was saying, uh, when we get a bigger Kazon ship, you put the Kazon raiding party on that, not on the raider. Because this depends on you having a big attack and being able to deal uh, multiple points of damage in a single attack. Um, and the, the Kazon raider is just not going to do that. The, the Nistra has a two natural attack, four if it's attacking somebody with scan. And that is the only time where you're going to get uh, this to go off. Uh, you, you do that with like a battle stations. So you have uh, expected damage output of three. Uh, Federation ships roll usually one defense die, so they can negate one of those. Then you might get it off. That's when it's likely to happen, and that makes this ship more of a Federation killer. But it, once, uh, uh, once more, uh, actually, we kill Federation and, uh, and and Borg. I bet the Borg have good tech. Uh, we haven't seen the Borg yet, but I bet they have tech worth stealing. Um, and they have a lot of shields too. The, the problem is, the, the problem with ignoring shields with specialized and non-repeatable attacks is that, sure, you ignore the shields for the first attack, but then the shields are still there, and you still have to get through them with your regular attacks. So, unless the critical effect is something that actually like helps shut down and cripple that ship in some way, it's, it's not worth it. Um, there, there's no actual added value there. There only appears to be. Unless you can finish them off. Uh, uh, without having to hit their shields, you, you gain no value out of ignoring their shields for a few attacks and then having to get through them with uh, regular attacks. Um, so the Kazon Raiding Party right now is garbage um, because it can't be put on anything other than a Kazon ship. Uh, when we get a larger Kazon ship, I will re, uh, revisit that evaluation, but uh, uh, don't, don't do it. It's a trap. So that's all the uh, the crew. Uh, it has three crew cards, two crew slots. So unless you flagship it up, you cannot run all of them. But that's okay because they're not all worth running. The uh, the tech is the tech is also kind of lackluster in this in this thematically Kazon kind of way. The Kazon were laughable as villains, and now they're laughable as a faction in this game. The, uh, the masking circuitry is the Kazon's cloaking device. It's one point cheaper than the, uh, the Federation of the Dominion cloaking devices, but you add a uh, auxiliary power token to your ship when you use it. Um, is that a, uh, a valuable trade? Is that a, a uh, worthwhile trade-off? Maybe? Could be. Um, the, uh, the, the Nishra Raider has decent green maneuvers. Uh, it's got one and two forward and then the one banks in both directions. Um, 
which means that it's going to be pretty easy for it to clear that auxiliary power. There's not, I mean, it, it's not like a, uh, it's not like trying to clear it with a, uh, a Keldon class that actually came with the Dominion uh, uh, cloaking device. Excuse me. Uh, but the other issue is that, is the question of whether or not the cloaking device tech upgrades are worth the points to begin with. Um, Three points, I think. It, I think if the, the masking circuitry was three points and did not put the auxiliary power token on there, it would probably be a good card. As it is, I'm just not sure that dropping that point is worth getting the auxiliary power token and effectively limiting your uh, maneuver choices uh, for the next turn. Especially considering that the, uh, the Kazon has a come about maneuver and uh, you're going to want that available uh, most of the time. Uh, and it's just it's not when you have auxiliary power. Um, but but as to whether whether it would be worth it in general, I am not a fan of the cloaking device tech upgrades. Uh, I think that cloaking as a single action is well balanced, and having to spend four points, or in this case three, on being able to take that action. I, I don't I don't see enough value in that. If you want a cloaking ship, run a cloaking ship. Don't try to make your other ships cloaking in a bad way. Um, the uh, the only the only use I see really for the for any of these cloaking upgrades this, this applies to all of them is the first. Pass if you're if you're running a, a fleet that does the pass where you, you basically fly right at the enemy and either veer off or come about, and you have that that initial contact that first uh, first round of engagement. You can use you can start off cloaked because you have a turn or two to to get yourself positioned, um, which will help you negate a few attacks, mitigate some damage, uh, and then afterwards you don't recloak. Then you get your shields back. And that allows you to uh, to that will increase your overall durability because then again they, they they bypass your shields for the first attack, but then you have your shields back, so then they they have to eat through that at the same time. Net gain nothing, and you get a few extra evade dice for that first round, uh, which can be really uh, uh, really tricky. Now, a cloaking device on a ship with a natural two agility, as the uh, as the Nistrum Raider actually does. It gives you six uh, evade or, or seven at range three, uh, which is a really good amount of defense dice. And if the uh, if the raider is taking like battle stations uh, that that turn, that could actually turn into a lot of evasion. Um, the problem is that because you have to disable the upgrade to recloak, you get very limited use out of it. Um, you you can't cloak and attack every turn like Klingons or Romulans can. Uh, and I think that is the big advantage of having Cloak for those uh, for those factions. And uh, As of right now, I don't see a cloaking Nistrum Raider to be a big threat um, in, uh, in competitive play. The, uh, the other upgrade is Photonic Charges, which is their weapon upgrade. Now this is one of the most laughable weapon upgrades I've seen. It is only slightly better than the uh, photon torpedoes that came with the uh, Gemidar battleship, which are absolute garbage. They're coasters. That's all they're good for. Um, the photonic charges, you have to disable them to use it. It's only at range one or two, and you roll three attack dice, um, which is one more than the uh, the raider gets naturally, but it doesn't get its uh, its special ability bonus with this weapon because it only gets it with its primary weapon. And then as an extra effect, you place an auxiliary power token beside the target ship if there is if there's at least one uncancelled hit or crit. Um, once again, you're never going to be getting that effect against cloaked ships. So Klingons and Romulans uh, are practically immune to everything that the Kazon are ever going to throw at them. Um, the, it will work for uh, uh, Federation and for Borg and for some of the larger uh, ships like the Battleship, uh, uh, some of the Dominion ships. But though 
at least for the, the, the Federation and Dominion, they have higher captain skills than the Kazon, um, almost universally. Any other captains that are worth running for the Federation are higher skill than Kulla. Um, which means that they are going to uh, they're going to perform green maneuvers. Oh, this is this is a, a weapon upgrade, anyways. So they so basically they're they're going to perform their green maneuvers and get their actions, anyways, because an auxiliary power token gained during the combat phase not nearly as devastating as an auxiliary power token gained during the activation phase can be if you activate after the opponent. Or, uh, er, er, sorry, if you activate before the opponent. I am getting all of my numbers mixed up. So, if this was an action to use, and you could you could potentially add an auxiliary power token to a ship uh, before it activates for that round, um, then you you have this sort of threat against the enemy. You know, do, are, when they're setting their, their maneuver dial, do you think I'm going to use this this round? Mm, maybe. Uh, if I get that uh, that auxiliary power token on you, and you have a red maneuver set, I get to choose your maneuver, and that can be absolutely devastating. That can be a gain loss in one mistake. But this goes during the combat phase, which means that the opponent gets to set their green maneuver next round, and uh, and and clear it out and get their actions. So net benefit, nothing except limiting their uh, their maneuver options. It's not that big a deal most of the time. You run against like an Enterprise D. It's got a 360 arc. It doesn't care where it is. Uh, you run it against a, uh, a battleship. Uh, yeah. Uh, does anyone actually run the battleship without the dorsal weapons array? I suspect not. So their position on the battlefield is not all that important for the big ships, the ones that are most... Im the ones that, that I, in my uh, my experience, are run the most. you got the uh, the... the Federation heavies, the Dominion heavies. You don't even have to worry about the uh, the Romulans and the Klingons. They'll never get hit by this. Um, so overall, and, and it's three points, which is pretty cheap for a secondary weapon, but it's an awful, awful secondary weapon. Um, and I understand that the Kazon aren't supposed to have really good weapons, but if this was a one-point upgrade, and again, this sort of applies to all the Kazon upgrades. I think they're all overcosted. Um, if this was a one-point upgrade, yeah, sure, throw it on. It's situationally good. Um, uh, uh, and I think it, it, who knows, maybe it'll be really good against the Borg. Maybe. Uh, we haven't seen the Borg stuff. I hope that the Borg have some uh, defensive abilities, because otherwise they're going to get absolutely destroyed by the Breen. Um... But uh, but overall, I think this ship it's it's hard countered by two of the four major factions uh, in this game. Romulans and Klingons have absolutely nothing to fear from this ship, and I think that makes it by itself a really poor ship. Um, it because you know half of the the factions in the game don't care that it's on the battlefield. Um, and then it's it's reasonably good against the other two factions, uh, but I think there's a lot of ways to waste your your fleet points on uh, on these upgrades. And yeah, I think I think the the designers probably like the Kazon about as much as I do, and that shows in uh, how they made this ship largely worthless. I wouldn't say entirely worthless. Uh, as, as I said, the, the ship itself actually has a lot of potential, and I think if they introduce another Kazon ship, maybe two, uh, then then this can really start to shine with the right upgrades. The problem is that these upgrades are not the right upgrades for this ship, um, largely. Uh, there was, um, uh, uh, Tierna is actually a really good upgrade for this ship, but again, I think overcosted, um, especially because it, it takes your action to do it. Um, so that's my review of the Nistrum Raider. Um, overall, I would give this a, a D. It's not a complete loss. It can be salvaged. I'm sure people will come up with all sorts of combos. Uh, they will require cross-factioning. Um, you know, uh, uh, dumping... Um, they're probably going to involve like putting a flagship on there and the cloaking device and then like an interface generator. Uh, that would actually, I think, be a really awful 
combo that'd be so many points for so little benefit. Um, but like secondary weapons, probably you know, dump you dump a five die secondary weapon on there, um, or a, a dorsal weapons array even increased damage and three sixty shot. Um, which it, the use of that is mitigated somewhat by the fact that it comes with a one eighty degree arc naturally, so you're usually going to be pointed in the right direction. Um, but you put like a, a Dominion torpedoes on there for for six points. You fire uh, uh, you know five die attack at one in hundred and eighty degrees. Um, but then why not just run a, a, a Cardassian ship? Okay. It, it seems to me like any job that the Nistrum Raider can do, other ships can do better. That's the impression that I get about it. It's not a completely awful ship. It's just way below average. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I look forward to the upcoming uh, reviews, the, the Borg Sphere, the, uh, the, the Species 8472 Bioship, and Voyager. Um, I am most excited for the Borg Sphere, uh, and then the other two... Uh, I, I want to see them both. Um, I have a, a personal hatred for, for Voyager as a show, but I suspect that Voyager is going to be a good ship. Um... And it's probably going to come with a lot of good cards. And by a lot, I mean a lot of good cards. Uh, the, the packaging on that thing is extra thick because they put a lot of extra cards in there. So the content value of Voyager is going to be really good. Um, and then the Borg, of course, are the Borg. They're amazing. Uh, just what I've seen so far, little blurbs, like the, the spin maneuver and, uh, and the fact that they've got 360 shot, they've got a new action. Like, this is all really juicy information. Um... And, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about them. Species 8472, I'm on the fence about as far as whether I like them as a concept. As a ship, I'm hoping they'll be good. I'm not, uh, I'm not as familiar with them as I am with other aspects of Trek. Uh, uh, most of Voyager I tried to repress since I watched it a long time ago. Um... So they're supposed to be good. We'll see. Uh, uh, I am probably going to get one. Um, I already have two Borg spheres uh, pre-ordered, so I'll be uh, I'll be running a double sphere build at some point. Um, and Voyager, even if I don't run the ship, I'm sure I'll find room for the upgrades. So uh, see y'all next time. Uh, hopefully around this time next week, uh, WizKids will put up the next preview, and I can do another one of these videos. So until then, have fun.